Thank you. This year, I have had the honor and privilege to work with a group of dedicated, hardworking, and passionate library professionals. Our work together was to award the 2019 John Newberry Medal. I would like to take a moment now to recognize my colleagues. Audience, please hold your applause until all members of the 2019 John Newberry Medal are standing. Mary Dubbs. Sandra Eklund. Robin Ellis Friedman. Eric Gomez. Pamela Archer Hamlin. Gregory D. Lum. Abigail Yvonne Morales. Emily Marokzik. Lalitha Nataraj. Alma Ramos McDermott. Stephanie Melash Rivera. Sue Z. Rokos. And Terrell A. Young. This year, the Newberry Committee chose two honor books. They are, in alphabetical order, The Book of Boy, written by Katherine Gilbert Murdoch, illustrated by Ian Schoner, and published by Green Willow Brooks, an imprint of HarperCollins Publishing. From Murdoch's first line, readers are swept into an epic quest across Europe in 1350 with Boy and a mysterious pilgrim adventuring to recover seven relics of St. Peter. Layered characters from goats to nuns, lyrical language, and multiple reveals combine to create this powerful story of redemption. Catherine Gilbert Murdoch, please come forward to accept the Newberry Honor Citation for the Book of Boy. The Night Diary, written by Vera Haranandandi and published by Ko Kalia, an imprint of Penguin Young Readers and a division of Random House, originally published by Dial Book for Young Readers and an imprint of Penguin Random House, was our other honor book this year. Following introspective Nisha and her family as they flee their homeland for an uncertain future, this book illuminates the 1947 partition of India with unprecedented balance and sensitivity. Through spare, evocative diary entries addressed to her late mother, Nisha discovers the complex beauty of her Hindu-Muslim identity. Vera Hiranandandi, Please come forward to accept the Newberry Honor Citation for the Night Diary. And now, the recipient of the 2019 John Newberry Medal is Mercy Suarez Changes Gears, 
written by Meg Medina and published by Candlewick Press. Using humor and grace, Meg Medina's warm, honest novel masterfully depicts one Cuban-American family's life with authenticity and empathy. We also meet Mercy, a charming and plucky protagonist who cycles through life's challenges with the support of her intergenerational family. This richly nuanced novel tackles the complexity of navigating a multicultural identity amidst changing family dynamics. Meg Medina. On behalf of the 2019 Newberry Medal Selection Committee, it is my truly great honor to acknowledge your distinguished achievement and to present you the John Newberry Medal for Mercy Suarez Changes Gears. Buenas noches. Good evening. Um, I am uh, stunned and happy to be with all of you, all of you here um, tonight, and to share this incredible moment on stage with Sophie, and with Chris, and with Vera, and with Alma, and with Catherine, um, and with all of the winners of uh, the ALA Awards this year. I've been making my way through that reading list that comes out in January, and um, I'm so grateful for it. It's, you've created beautiful work, and I feel so honored to be making work alongside of you. Thank you. Um, it's been six months since I received that life-changing phone call, and in all of that time, I've been wondering what to say right now. And I've decided that the safest thing to do is um, to tell you about Medici Suarez Changes Gears and this lovely award through my personal bike history. <laughs> so prepare yourself. I have owned four bikes in my life. The first one I got when I was six, it was forest green, and it had training wheels, and it arrived as something of a miracle because it was a gift from my father, a man I didn't remember at all. He and my mother had separated years earlier when they were recently arrived from Cuba. He had never lived with us in my lifetime, and so he was an utter mystery to me, almost a dark fantasy. What I did know had come in confusing snippets, just a child's peek into the mysteries of the adult world and all the ways that it could go wrong. Imagine my confusion then when my grandfather, Norberto Medina, my father's father, delivered this beautiful present to our building stoop one day, I hopped on that bike and I loved it instantly. There's a picture of me floating around. I was wearing a yellow spring coat back before global warming. Um, <laughs> and my grandfather took that shot Unfortunately, that bike wasn't meant to be mine for very long. One day, soon after I received it, I carelessly left it on the stoop to go upstairs to our apartment for a moment. And when I returned, you guessed it, 
It had been stolen, just as my mother had always warned. It is spectacularly bad symbolism. <laughs> but I still look back on that experience fondly. That bike and its disappearance taught six-year-old me that the most unexpected things happen sometimes, things that we barely understand, and some of them are truly wonderful, and some of them are awful and unfair. The next bike that I remember was my three-speed with a banana seat and those high ape hanger handlebars. Mm -hmm. And I had a plastic basket with daisies on the front and those blue fringes <gasps> from the grips. I was a legend on my block, <laughs> thanks to that bike, um, having mastered how to pop a wheelie. And I got that bike for Christmas maybe the year that I was 10. What's remarkable is that my mother gave me that bike. I say that it's remarkable because Ma wasn't really the bike type. In fact, my mother didn't know how to ride a bike herself or how to swim or how to drive a car. All the things that I would eventually learn to do. Those were activities that her parents in Cuba thought that girls should not engage in due to complicated and distorted interpretations of femininity. Anyway, my mother was generally a fretful person too. She saw danger at every turn. My life was always at risk. If talking with my mouthful could kill me with beans, imagine what a bike on the streets of Queens could do. And so the thought that she would give me a bike to ride in Flushing seemed unfathomable. But here's what's even more remarkable. My mother found a way to pay for that bike on her own. She was a single mother. She worked in a factory back then, and her budget, including my dad's alimony, was spoken for pretty much to the penny. There was no extra money for a bike, I'm very sure. But my mother, like many of the other immigrant ladies who worked alongside her testing transistors, was nothing if not resourceful. She was given the option of working through her vacation week so that she could get an extra week's pay, and that's what she did. And with that money, she bought me that bike. At 10, I didn't give a thought to how she had paid for it. I was dazzled by that banana seat. <laughs> I had received what I really wanted. And looking back, I'm sure my mother was tired and might have liked to have had a vacation, maybe to spend a week admiring the palm trees in Miami. She always talked about Miami as Mecca, after all, when things got bad in, her, in our building or at her job or with life in general. She threatened to pack us up and move us. Me voy pa Miami! <laughs> okay. But that year, she gave up her single week's worth of rest so that she could give me a vehicle of freedom that she herself had never owned. You can bet I bought a combination lock that time. <laughs> I love that bike because it took me around the block and then to other blocks and then to neighborhoods and then to places that my mother could not see. That bike taught me that problems can have surprising solutions. It taught me that in families, people sometimes willingly sacrifice for each other. In my 20s, when I was newly married, my husband Javier 
splurged, and showed up at our tiny apartment with my third bike. It was a bright red Peugeot 10-speed. They were all the rage in the 80s. It was the color of happiness, I thought, even though I had to crawl over it in the hall to reach it to, from our living room. It had more gears than I knew what to do with. The skinny tires were a disaster on the cracks in the sidewalk. But when I leaned over those ram horn handlebars with my young and supple back back then, I said, <laughs> I look fierce, I look slick, I look confident, none of which I felt inside. <laughs> that bike taught me that sometimes it's okay to enjoy style and flash, especially when you're young and there's plenty of time ahead of you to do sensible things. The last bike that I have is the one that's currently sitting in my garage. I bought it when we still lived in Florida over 20 years ago in a town where the flat landscape begged a beach cruiser with a nice comfy seat. Our first daughter was an infant then and I thought bike rides might help me understand the bewildering and unexpected new world of motherhood. Becoming a mother was harder than I had thought it would be. I worked with Easter seals and therapists and doctors who were trying to teach me all I would need to know to be her mom. So I'd strap my daughter into her little bike seat and ride with my neighbor from across the street, sometimes for miles and miles. And we'd eventually come to call those excursions our moon rides, because sometimes the sun would set and we'd still be pedaling, pushing, thinking, and talking. I have never gotten rid of that bike. I have owned it as all three of my kids have grown up and learned to ride their own bikes. I still had it when my mother and my aunt grew ill and came to live with us, an event that upended our lives in so many ways as anyone here who has done caretaking knows. Let me buy you a new one. Javier always tells me when he sees me haul it out into the driveway, I think he's embarrassed in front of the neighbors. <laughs> but something keeps me from accepting that sweet offer. It turns out the old seat is comfortable, especially now that I have some padding. <laughs> and I like the predictable squeaks and dings, even if my kids laugh at me. I ride that bike these days with joy and with ease, and I ride it wherever I feel like going, and I ride it with a well-earned sense of peace. That bike taught me that sometimes you have to pedal over really hard spots in your life until you grow stronger and you reach clarity. That is my life in bikes. And now, of course, there is this imaginary bike, the one that Merci Suarez pines for in Merci Suarez Changes Gears. What did that bike teach me? When I sat down to write that novel, I wasn't really thinking about bikes necessarily. Mostly, I was thinking about how to write in a time when so many disparaging characterizations of Latinx people have been taking hold. Whether it was aspersions being cast or border separations or the frightening uncertainty of the dreamers, I wanted to shake the world and shout, stop afflicting children with these terrible and hurtful words.
stop warping their view about who they are and what their value is, it is hard enough to start a new life in a new place. I had just finished writing a short story called Sol Painting Inc., which appeared in Flying Lessons and Other Stories, an anthology edited by Ellen O. in combination with Crown Books. That story was about a girl whose voice I thought could help me capture the warmth of family, the eccentricities, the troubles of a family, and make us all laugh with them and feel their, their pain as if it were our own family. Because in so many ways, the Suarezes are like all of you and like all of us. They are one big loving mess. What grew from that story is a novel with a bike as Merci's first longing, a way to steer herself through the sixth grade and all that awaits her during that wonderful and bewildering year. Merci Suarez and her family are a Cuban clan who live intergenerationally, interconnectedly in Florida as my mother dreamed of doing and they're a family that sacrifices for each other in large and small ways every day, which is, I think, the most important legacy that the elders in my family left me. And what does Merisi find out? I think just what I have, that life is full of wonderful surprises, like new friends in the sixth grade, and sometimes lousy ones like loneliness or family illness. She discovers, as all children will, that happiness and heartbreak coexist in a life well lived. Sometimes all there is to do for it is to switch to a different gear and push on, always with the hope of a better day. I am so grateful that this novel resonated with readers and with this year's Newberry Selection Committee. I'm delighted that the Suarez family will live in books forever. And I'm so honored to accept this award and to have my book join such an auspicious company with the previous medalists. My appreciation is boundless and first and foremost to my editor, Kate Fletcher, who took a risk on me all those years ago when she first started acquiring and when I was first starting to publish. I'm grateful for her good questions and her calm and thoughtful guidance as I reach inside sometimes where I don't really want to go. Kate, I cherish all that we have shared over the years. Our crazy bike taxi ride on the Manhattan that time that we nearly got killed on, the missed flights, the tough schedules, even the wardrobe failures that we've seen together. What a journey, Miss Kate. I'm thankful to Teen Meg at Candlewick, Karen Lotz and John Mendelson, Jennifer Roberts, Susan Batchelor, Andy Krosick, the utterly heroic Phoebe Kozman who runs my schedule, Kathleen Rourke, and Anne Irza Leggett, Pam Consolazio, and just the entire staff from top to bottom who labor on my behalf. Thank you for all the ways that you patiently entertained my ideas for the, this book, for buying those bike bells that were very cool, um, and um, for setting a <laughs> You see, they're good. Thank you, Candlewick, for setting such a high bar for what it means to develop authors with respect and great care over time. Many thanks to Josepeda for the beautiful cover. A, yes, it is beautiful. A huge thanks to the Andrea Brown Literary Agency, specifically my agent, Jen Rofe, who is my fiercest advocate. Don't mess with her. 
thank you, Jen, for pushing me to ask and to dream and to reach even when I don't think I can get there. Mostly I am sending love and thanks to my many friends and colleagues in the Children's Lit community sitting here. Some of you I have known and loved for a lifetime. Some of you have come into my life through publishing and you are professional friends who have now morphed into my lifeline. And still others are that wonderful category of friends that I see at these bookish events and we throw our arms up and say, ah, as we walk by each other. And I just love when that happens. How I appreciate all of our conversations and the moments when we give each other advice and lend an ear, how meaningful it has been to feel your love and support, not only right now for this medal, but during all the years that have led up to it. This is especially true of my many friends who've been in the trenches of getting more voices to the table, particularly my fellow Latinx book creators, and also those I have met through We Need Diverse Books, my colleagues at Hamlin University's MFA program, my friends regionally and nationally at SCBWI, the work of fairness and love is hard and fraught and essential to the children we write for. What a privilege to know and learn and work with you. Thank you to the librarians and teachers and booksellers who have brought my books to readers and who have simply made my career for all the ways that you treat the authors as stars, you are really the ones moving mountains. And in this, a special shout out to my friends at Reforma. Mi gente. My friends at the Ezra Jack Keats Foundation also. <laughs> Who turned, early, who turned eyes toward my early work and who daily do the hard work of elevating new voices from all corners. And now most especially to my new family, Ellen Riordan and the entire committee, Mary and Sandy and Robin, Eric, Pam, Gregory, Abby, Lali, Alma, Stephanie, Sue, Terrell, Emily, what a lovely dinner we had last night. You can ask me for anything, the answer is yes. <laughs> the thank you for deliberating for hours and hours and hours and for choosing my book to represent children's literature in this way. And of course, to my husband and children who I will not look at right now, <laughs> who are here tonight, maybe feeling bad about all the trash they talk about my bike. <laughs> thank goodness that I thanked you all in private because we all know I couldn't possibly get through this in public without a major meltdown. It must have been grueling to watch the sausage making that is the shaping of a writer's career. Thank you for believing that it could happen. Here we are on this happy day. Thank you be, for being everything to me. And thank you everyone. Know that I will never forget this night. Muy buenas noches. Gracias.